Hey guys and welcome back to another tutorial and in this tutorial we're going to be setting up integration testing kind of as a co continuation to my last video where we set up the GraphQL project and this will allow you to kind of better test your resolvers as well as uh, make sure that everything your entire backend flow is working as intended by actually connecting and creating objects in a database as opposed to just mocking it out. If you're coming from my previous video where we kind of went ahead and set up this entire project, you'll notice that I've made a couple of changes in regards to kind of like the folder structure as well as adding a couple of things. Um, some of these changes include creating different types of classes in the Prisma file. So instead of uh, just being client and context, they're actually a little bit more specific. They're the Prisma client, Prisma context added some interfaces, added some uh, new configuration uh, folder within this lib, so this Apollo server config, as well as kind of change how we actually instantiate our Apollo server to use that configuration. You'll see later on when we're creating our integration test, the reason why I did that is to kind of make it a little bit more reusable and also um, updated some of the code gen and uh, things like that, as well as updated the test structure so that our unit tests are actually right next to um, the actual test that it's unit testing. So um, what I went ahead and did, and if you go into the blog tube repository that I linked in my other video, you'll notice that there is a new project called uh, GQL TS something uh, with regard to this project, but um, the main branch will actually have the entire code that with all of the new integration test changing, so like the Docker files and things like that available. So what I went ahead and did was I created a new branch called starter within that, so that you should be able to uh, check out to that starter branch and get this uh, starter template so that you guys can follow along in the video. I'll put a link to it in the description below as well for you guys, so just a heads up on that and let's get started. First thing we're going to do is we're going to add a package called .env-cli and the reason that we're going to be adding this package is because Prisma, uh, the way that it sets up its migrations and the way that it plays with like containers and things like that, it gets a little confusing as to which environment variables are actually being set up. So one way that uh, Jest usually is kind of recommended to set up your environment variables for your test is to use like a test setup file. But I found that uh, when I'm trying to do a migration against the test database and I try to pass in this like, let's say for example, like a dot env dot test um it actually goes ahead and reads the original dot env as opposed to my dot env and test and it gets a little confusing so the best way that i found to kind of make it so it's very consistent is to use this dot env dash cli library so the first thing we're going to do after adding that library is we're going to actually go ahead and create a configuration folder that's kind of going to host our different environment files. So for example, we're going to create an environment.test file and then within this test file, we're going to add similar to our normal .env, we're going to add a database URL to point to our local uh, integration tests database. And so I went ahead and actually set up a user here so I can show you guys without kind of any passwords um, that I use anywhere else. Kind of how to set this up correctly. So you'll just have this environment variable here. And then what you gotta do is we're going to actually go ahead and we're going to uh, create the, kind of the testing structure that we are going to add for our integration tests. This folder structure is going to kind of be similar to our old structure, but instead we're gonna have an integration folder and then kind of follow along where our GraphQL folder structure is happening. So after we create that folder structure, we're actually gonna go ahead and create a integration test for the create book mutation. And as you can see here, I kind of split up, uh, you can actually change the file name with .int. And if you haven't noticed, I've also changed my book service test to .unit. And the reason for that is because yesterday I actually found out that Jest allows for regex matching on the command line. So I could just do something like Jest unit. And what it'll actually do is that it'll regex match any kind of file name that includes unit in it. So, or .unit test. So pretty much it just adds the unit to its regex finder, which is really cool. I actually didn't know about it before. So this just makes it a lot easier to split up your unit and your integration tests. Let's go ahead and actually uh, define this test file and kind of walk through what we're doing in it. And so pretty much the first thing that we're doing is that we're going to create a create book mutation that we're going to kind of use to represent the mutation that we are trying to test. And we're gonna run this mutation against our Apollo server. 
So as you can see here, we're pretty much just taking an input that is gonna be expected to be the create book input type, as well as actually calling the mutation and then returning type name, ID, title, and author. And then we're going to go ahead and start describing our test. And then within our test, we're going to create a Apollo server instance, which we're going to use to execute our mutation against. We're going to kind of just create this constant book, which we get from, if you remember, our schema type def GQL book. We're just expecting it to be the same as this type of GraphQL object. Then we also go ahead and before all of our tests run, we actually go ahead and create a new Apollo server. And you can see here that we're actually using that Apollo server config that I mentioned that I split up a little bit before. And the reason for that is because I wanted to make it reusable. So this is kind of easier for us to do it within all of our integration tests. And then after we actually go ahead and run these tests, what I want to do is I actually want to go through the database and delete any books that I already created. So if I create a book, I don't want it to be lingering for my other integration tests. So what I go ahead and do is I delete many. And then I also go ahead and disconnect that Prisma client. And because we're going to create a new one at the next, um, pretty much at the next integration test file that we run. So, and that's okay because it's not a very expensive, um, uh, operation to create this Prisma client. So that's totally fine. And then we're actually going to go ahead and define our test. And then within this test, we just create that create book input, which is just a mock book. And then we actually go ahead and run this execute operation, which is actually going to take that create book mutation that we define. And we're going to pass it the input as the mock book. And then we're going to assert some tests. So the first thing we want to do is that we expect result.data, meaning that our commutation was successful to be defined. We also expect that the create book part of the data to be defined, meaning that it was successful. And then we're gonna break that out into a variable, which then we're just gonna go ahead and do some assertions as to what we expect. So here type name, we expect it to be book, the uh, title to be a title, author to be author. And then you can see here also that I'm doing create book ID to be defined as opposed to like, let's say for example, one. And the reason for that is because the Prisma context, uh, we are going to be resetting it once we kind of start this container. But as we kind of go ahead and create books or do something like that, the context maintains the same. And, um, I didn't really see fit to make it so that we had to reset the database after every single integration test file that we run. So I just let it be defined, meaning that it should be there, meaning that it exists. And with that, we can actually go ahead and probably update our test scripts within our package JSON. And uh, let me actually make this a little bit bigger so it might be a little bit easier for you guys to see. And what I'm going to update is I'm going to update our test and I'm going to change it around a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, just has this regex matcher that you can actually add. And um, the way to do that is, so I'm going to do just unit, meaning that catch any file name that has dot unit within it and add it to my regex for my uh, just, which would be the unit dot test pretty much. So that's gonna run all of our unit tests. And then for integration tests, it's something similar. So it's just int. And then the dash i is kind of used to avoid race conditions. So it means run one at a time as opposed to asynchronously where you might have two different things inserting and uh, the thing that you return is the Prisma context returns something different. So um, be careful with that. And then I'm going to update our test to run both of these together. So we're gonna first run our unit tests and then we're going to run our integration tests. Quickly before we get too ahead of ourselves, um, as I mentioned before, we have this to be defined. I kind of want to show you guys what would happen. For example, if I were to make it to be 100 and the expected behavior, at least how I kind of saw it initially, is that when we run our integration test, it should have a database that the context is brand new and everything is fresh, right? But as you'll notice that since we're using the ID to kind of be at this auto incremented value of one, here you can see that we actually received five and that's because I've kind of ran these tests five times. So then the Prisma context for this kind of database is set to five right now. And um, one way that we could actually go ahead and set this to kind of be a little bit more consistent is if we wanted to kind of reset this context anytime we're gonna run our integration test, right? So the way that we do that is let's first go ahead and change this to, to be one. And then what I'm going to do within our package.json, I'm actually going to create this new script called generate reset. And so pretty much what this is going to do is I'm going to tell Prisma to kind of migrate a reset, meaning, hey, whatever context already exists within this database, 
completely erase it. So let's start everything from scratch, right? And so once we do that, what we can actually do is we can actually update our integration test. And here kind of comes that .env CLI that I mentioned a little bit earlier, where I couldn't really get this to work with the setup files because it would set up my normal environment and then it will look at my uh, the wrong database and it would reset the wrong uh, context and everything like that. So. What we're going to do is we're going to update this to actually go ahead and run uh, this .env CLI and we're going to point it to our .env dash tests uh, configuration here so that it could tell itself that it, hey we're actually going to be using this user this password and we're going to be looking at the test database to go ahead and run our reset which will just reset that database's context and then before we run our uh, integration test we're also going to pass along that config.env.test so that it knows to run our integration test against that database. So if we go ahead and redo our integration test here, you can see that the test actually didn't run correctly and it ran the first part which we can quickly look at to see that it did reset the database successfully but i forgot to include the dash e flag so i didn't know where to look to uh, point this in dot env environment variables so now if we actually go ahead and run our integration test again we're going to be able to see that we're kind of going ahead and creating this database reset we're then also going to uh, kind of use this initiating migration to create our table and and then we're actually going to go ahead and run our integration test and if we remember correctly we actually changed this to b1 meaning that this is going to be expected to be the first book created within our database context right so once this finishes you can see here that it passed and that one is it's always going to pass correctly this way but the reason for that is because we're resetting the context every time and what I mean by that is we reset the context at the initial uh, start of the integration test. But what were to happen if I say, for example, let's create a exact copy. So second, or let's just create mutation to dash int dot test dot ts, right? And let's say we run the exact same uh, integration test, right? So then if I go ahead and run test integration, what is expected to kind of happen, right? Or at least this is how it happened with me when I was kind of playing around with this, is that I expected that running this kind of delete many within the after all should erase all of the books and then uh, when I go to create the new one it's going to create at one again and that isn't necessarily the case of what happens and that's because we're running the same kind of Prisma context Prisma client throughout these integration tests so you'll, what you'll see here is that our create book mutation actually passed because it did expect it to be one but then once we actually go into the mutation two test you can see here that the actual value received is two and that's because we're reusing the same context between these two integration files but we're only resetting the database at the initial uh, call of the integration test so that's kind of just a quick explanation as to why I prefer to just leave it as to be defined I didn't really necessarily want to kind of keep looking as to how I could reset the database context after each file and so I wasn't really too keen on that it's not that big of a deal at least for this case so um, yeah and we can now go ahead and actually remove that test and let's say yep let's change this back to to be defined and there we go and so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start setting this up so we kind of have this local integration test working correctly and sometimes I'm sure you've always heard like oh but it works on my machine and that can kind of become annoying like if your configuration on your local machine of Postgres might not be correct or it's a different version or who knows what could possibly happen one way that I kind of like to add a little bit more robustness to my testing is that by adding a Docker kind of test environment that'll be the same no matter who runs it from what computer. And one of the prerequisites that I kind of have right now is that you should have kind of Docker installed. But if you don't, um, you can actually go to there, just Google get install Docker, go ahead and follow their Docker uh, installation, whether it's using Linux that you'll just use app get or you can use uh, their Docker desktop. So once you kind of have that installed, what we're then going to want to do is we're actually going to go ahead and we're going to be creating a Docker Compose. And so if you're not familiar with what Docker Compose does, it's pretty much kind of like a uh, composition file that you can kind of define a bunch of different services and then just run like Docker Compose up and it'll go through the list of services and kind of create that for you and it just automates the process. So after we create that Docker Compose file, let's go ahead and actually give it some um, implementation. And so 
Here's kind of a quick explanation of what uh, this Docker Compose is doing. And this is kind of cool because it's gonna go two ways. One, this Docker Compose is going to allow us to run this uh, Apollo server kind of uh, project within its own isolated environment within Docker. So what I'm doing is that I'm kind of setting up this server, which I expect to be our um, actual Apollo server and we're going to then tell it to hey we're going to build this local and so right now it hasn't been set up but I'm going to set up a docker file for this and so that's what this context dot is and same with target base but then what I'm doing is I'm going to tell it to hey these are the ports that I want to use so 4000 on the left is your local host machine so this is like my computer and then the, this uh, the right side of it is actually the docker container port so my local computer port 4000 is going to map to the docker uh, port 4000 so that way you can kind of communicate I'm going to add the pens on because I want my server it depends on this database to be up and running and then I'm going to create a network for them to be able to communicate between each other you can probably use the default but I like to just kind of um, set it up so that it's, it's not too difficult to just set up like a custom network um, and then yeah so then we have the database and so for the database what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a pre-registered image of Postgres version 13 this will go out and actually go to Docker Hub and grab this uh, image and then kind of download it to my local computer so that I can always uh, use it when I want to create this container I'm going to tell it to restart always uh, I'm going to name it uh, database same here I'm going to name it server and then um, I'm going to do the same thing with up here I'm going to open up my port 5432 to 5432 I don't know if you necessarily need it to be open like this you could probably just expose so you could probably do something like expose uh, 5432 where you can only so that way it only exposes the internal database port but for right now for this uh, since docker isn't the main thing that we're kind of going over in this tutorial I'm going to leave it like that and then I'm going to pass in a couple of environment variables to this postgres container meaning that I'm, I want to create this postgres uh, instance with the postgres user prisma the postgres password is also going to be prisma and then the database that we're going to be using is test similar to how we just set up in our env.test here but this would be prisma prisma and then what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that these two containers are within the same network and this network is going to be type bridge um, again we don't need to necessarily go too into detail of what that means and I, as I was mentioning before, one thing that we're going to do now is we're going to create a Docker file that's going to act as kind of like the build file to uh, define our server container. So the way to do that is that we just kind of instantiate this Docker file. And within this Docker file, I'm going to kind of uh, create something like this. And so what's happening here? So pretty much similar to the Postgres, what I'm doing is I'm kind of grabbing this uh, node 14.15.4 Alpine, which just Alpine is pretty much like, give me the least amount of things I need, dependencies I need really to run this as a container. And I'm gonna instantiate this as my target base. So as if you've noticed before, talk, Docker Compose is actually gonna build the context to my target base as well. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to set the working directory and then we're going to first install bash and there's a reason that we're installing uh, the bash within this container and I'll get that back to that later. So then what pretty much all we're doing here is instead of installing dependencies, we're kind of just going ahead and copying a bunch of files from our local project to this container project. So pretty much what we're doing is like, hey, let's create package star JSON and yarn lock and we're gonna send it to our container slash app. Same thing here. So like right now you can see that we're doing this environment.docker, but we actually don't have that. And so what we wanna do is we're going to go ahead and create a config slash dot env dot docker. And then within this, what we're going to add is something similar to uh, this test file, but actually instead we're going to be adding Prisma and Prisma, which is what we defined within our Docker compose. So once that's set up, we're going to be copying that .env.docker and we're going to be actually rewriting it in our container to .env.test. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because I wanted to kind of maintain something similar as to how I run my integration tests on my local machine to how I run it on the container. So if I just have to kind of worry about one environment file, .env.test, I can kind of make it so it's the same both ways. There's a, you could also kind of instantiate environment variables in here. I just found this was a little bit more consistent and let's just make it as close as possible. So once we have that, we're actually going to then copy all of the source files. We're going to copy our TS config. We're going to copy our jest config. We're going to copy pretty much 
just the things that are really necessary to run. So we're gonna leave like ESLA and all that things out, but we're gonna copy bin, we're gonna copy the Prisma, code gen, um, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to run yarn install. And what this does is it checks if there's anything that's changed between the package lock that is currently being passed and uh, the old kind of remembered cached package lock. And if it does, then it'll run a yarn install. Um, then we're going to run yarn generate. So this is going to generate our GraphQL schema code generation. We're also then going to run our Prisma generate to, Pris uh, to generate our Prisma client. And then last but not least, we're going to run a yarn build and yarn start. And this will kind of start this container up for us. And this isn't necessarily anything that we need to do to get integration tests working, but I figured I might as well do it right here if we're going to uh, be kind of using something similar anyway. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to be adding this kind of wait for it shell script. And this is a pretty cool thing that I was able to find online. And um, it was kind of, it's on a GitHub. It's got a, like, I think 2000 forks and quite a bit of likes. Pretty much what this does is it tells me like, hey, I'm going to be running some kind of uh, script or some kind of command on this container, but I want you to actually make sure that the other container, for example, I want to make sure that my database container is actually up and running before I run these scripts. So you can kind of pass this script along and it'll actually wait until it, that other container or whatever you're waiting for actually gives kind of a signal saying like, hey, I'm ready to go or I'm up and ready. And then it'll actually go and execute whatever the command is. So um, I don't necessarily want to go too into depth. Honestly, I haven't really even looked at this myself. I just know it works pretty well. So um, there's that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add our Docker scripts to our package JSON. And so what we want to do is after Prisma Studio, I'm going to kind of create these couple of um, Docker scripts. And pretty much what we're doing is we're going to be, let's just make that down here. And then there we go. So pretty much what we're doing here is Docker up is going to just run Docker compose up, which just pretty much builds and starts our containers. Docker down is pretty much going to tear everything down once we're done. Docker test run is what's a little bit interesting here. So as I mentioned before here, we're going to be using the Docker compose run against our server, but it, it's not necessarily what we're doing here is pretty much we're going to be saying like, hey, within this uh, container that's called server, run this shell script. So pretty much what I'm doing is I'm running the shell script within my container, right? Saying wait for it. And then as you can see here, the name is DB. So that kind of comes back to networking within Docker. And uh, you can actually, instead of having to say local host or things like that, you can actually specify the container name and it actually knows how to get to it. So here we want to do DB on 5432, wait for that to give the okay, saying, hey, I'm up and ready. And then once that's done, run yarn test, which will then run our unit test. And it'll also run our inner integration tests all within this one kind of uh, brand new test environment. And it can kind of be consistent between uh, no matter whose computer is running from it. And another thing that kind of brings up to mind is that, uh, if you can see here the .env.docker previously, so this is saying localhost because I kind of copied from .test, but this actually needs to be DB. And the reason for that is, as I just mentioned, Docker kind of has this neat little way of being able to use some like DNS registries between like the name and like figure out like, okay, you actually want to call this DB container, but the name is that. So it's really cool. And the best thing that we can do to make sure everything is running correctly is let's just go ahead and actually run our environment uh, file. So, or not file, my script. So pretty much what this is doing is we're telling, hey, let's create our Docker container ecosystem. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to run that uh, set of commands against that server container. And then once that's all done, so if you're not familiar with how chaining commands within kind of like command line works, um, I found that you can, uh, if you do an and, pretty much what that means is saying, hey, if this exits successfully, then run this. And then there's another one by or, meaning that like if this fails, then run this. And then the cool one is if you just put a single ampersand, and I also didn't know this until this week, if you put a single ampersand, it pretty much says, no matter the outcome of this previous command, if it succeeds, run, if it fails, run. So this pretty much just guarantees that no matter what happens within our Docker run, if our test failed or something like that, it will always bring down all of these containers that we just set up for this test environment. And with that, just a little bit more cleanup. Um, what I actually like to do within the Docker up script, 
I actually like to add the dash dash build, which pretty much just tells Docker like, hey, generate a new image, meaning that it's gonna be kind of like a fresh install every single time. And then the kind of annoying thing about this setup is that I have kind of split it up into a bunch of different environment files, right? So as you can see, I have .env.docker and then .env, and these kind of resemble each other, but this is kind of the Docker way. .env.docker.test is supposed to kind of uh, resemble the .env.test. And the reason that I do this is because as you can see here, I'm actually using this kind of the DB uh, DNS registration Docker network kind of setup. I'm not entirely sure if I, using localhost, I think should possibly work as well, but I like to kind of just keep it safe. Let's just split up my Docker as well as kind of what I'm expecting for my local stuff. And then also what I like to do is I like to go ahead and also in the Docker file, I need to make sure that all of these files are actually being kind of configured correctly, meaning that, hey, let's actually send over our config.env.docker as well as the config.env.docker.test and making sure that those are available within our container and then that they're actually being kind of like rewritten to the different type of environment file. So then actually what I can also then do is I also modified the test environment, uh, the Docker test run. So what previously was happening was that it was kind of generating a new instance running against our database and then kind of removing it. But what we could actually do is since we're already initializing the kind of the Docker container for our server project. And you can see here that I changed to actually run the CMD yarn start. And the reason for that is because this allows it to actually exit after we run yarn start, as opposed to if I run yarn build and yarn start, it actually started the, uh, the container, but it would be kind of stuck in this uh, hold because it was still within it. And then we'd have to kind of close the container in order to get out of it. And then it just wouldn't really work. So if we run, uh, if we add CMD yarn start, that means that it kind of starts up the container. And then what we then do is that since we already have this server container up and running due to talk, Docker Compose, we can actually go ahead and just run uh, our execute script, right? So the wait for a script to DB5432 and our yarn test script against that already created server, meaning that we don't have to create another instance, which just saves a lot of time. So then once you see, once we actually go ahead and you run this kind of test again, you'll see that it's gonna go ahead and kind of build a new image. And this does still take a little while, but you kind of get the best of both worlds of like being able to set up uh, the container infrastructure. And then as you can see, it actually went ahead, created this new image for us, as well as kind of did the database reset, created the two containers, ran our test suite, and then it finally went through and composed down and kind of destroyed the containers that we generated for this. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of about it. That's kind of just a nice little way to set up uh, integration testing both locally as well as setting up kind of integration testing uh, with like a test environment as well as also just using Docker to kind of create a containerized uh, system where you can kind of just make it a little bit more consistent and not necessarily have to run it on your machine. And you can kind of try to use that to simulate what it would actually be like if it were running on any machine, right? Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much all there is to this tutorial. Uh, we did go a little deeper into Docker than I was kind of hoping, but I do believe that in order to kind of get really successful integration tests working, it's kind of nice to actually be able to test it against your local database, but also be able to kind of spin up and destroy a database and instance whenever you kind of need to run that integration test against, meaning that it's always fresh and always up to date and yeah, so that's kind of all I have for you guys today and I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. And then if you guys did, please also leave a like as well as comment and subscribe. Or then if I did miss anything or if you guys have any suggestions on how I can improve this, please let me know. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Thanks.